Welcome, everyone. And the teachings of the four karmas, they're often called, are very powerful. I think they're extraordinarily practical and helpful. There are four stages that actually create like a template that we can imagine or work through in our minds in terms of putting ourselves in the best possible position to get kindness, openness, and cooperation out of some aspect of our world. So they're not necessarily maybe designed to use if you're hell-bent on attacking someone or if you're just really uh, completely committed to shutting yourself off in whatever else you want to do. But during times when you feel maybe you're open and maybe it'll benefit you to actually open your heart and connect to another person or open your heart and connect to yourself, these uh, four stages are remarkable. They're really remarkable in their ability to help. I, I've uh, used them in esoteric ways as kind of a you know, the discussion on stages of enlightenment. I've also used them in my coaching to talk people through dates uh, because it's like a perfect um, kind of setup for anything that you might find difficult and uncomfortable. So from the mundane to the spiritual, the four stages of the Buddha are pacify, which is the first stage, the color is white. Sometimes the color um, evokes a feeling better than words might. And white is very much the feeling in Hinduism. This is referred to in, as the Kriya sy systems, of the Kriya traditions, Kriya yoga, etc. So the yogis that go into purification rituals and that kind of thing. In Vajrayana Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism, it's also the color white and the sense of um, purification, meaning that we're just letting go of the darkness for a moment, letting go of the ways that we're caught or the ways that we're distracted or the ways that we're unhappy just for a moment and flashing the sense of openness. Sometimes that sense of openness can be quite simple and can be quite quick. Sometimes before I go into a talk or in a situation where I don't have a lot of time to get into heavy meditation, I'll just flash the sense of openness, the sense of just release and relaxation. Kemet Chodron said this sense of openness is like a refrigerator that's been on and you didn't notice it and then it goes off, or an air conditioner that maybe was making a lot of noise and then all of a sudden goes off. And there's this like openness and space, the sense of just, uh, if you will. And the reason this is the base of the pyramid or the you know, place to begin the situation, what Trumper and Boucher in his art teachings called uh, square one, right, the very beginning, the blank slate, the white canvas, the open book, so to speak, before we start anything, is because rather than entering a situation with preconceptions, you maybe could just flash the sense of openness and release. And the real activity here is one of acceptance, accepting yourself allowing yourself to just be present. And there's another adjective, which I like, which is a sense of an adjective, which is really more of a verb, maybe an adverb, but a sense of humbleness and humility. Really realizing that, not that we're diminishing ourselves at all, but we're just noticing our right size, that we're actually quite small in the pantheon of possibility in the universe. And as soon as we let go of ourselves and can just let ourselves be empty, present, and not proclaiming, not trying, not being, 
as soon as we can do that, then we have everything else is here with us. There is nothing that's not part of the picture. When we diminish our ego sense, we actually see the fullness and richness of the life around us. And it's actually quite rewarding. So rather than actually diminishing oneself, humbleness and humility, in this case, is actually a way to gain access to everything. It's like the meekness of a tiger who's totally relaxed, open, and just present, but completely capable of defending itself and completely passionate and alive, virile, and fertile, and all of those procreative words, <laughs> all the animal words that we have, you know, to actually connect to the writ of our being. But it all starts with this sense of just openness before a tiger, you know, attacks or appropriates or nurtures or does any of its activities. It begins with this sense of repose, and connection and complete relaxation. If we start from a sense of serenity, then our actions after that are likely to be a little more accurate and clear. When we act out of anxiety and nervousness and fear, then our actions are almost certainly subject to karma, which is to say the conditioning that we've already put our mind through, the things we've done over and over and over again. When we're panicked, when we're depressed, when we're unhappy, we will go back to doing the same things we have always done. And that's okay, we could forgive that, but this first stage is about accepting all of that and calming down and trying to find the serenity and the balance within it, that we actually can find this sense of openness that leads us to stability and connects us to the earth, right? So there's this sense of fresh start every time we come back to the earth sense of ah uh, openness and from there anything can happen it's very interesting because i've gone through very stressful difficult times lately um not very recently but six months ago eight months ago extraordinarily difficult situation for me uh and protracted for a period of months uh, a lot of aggression and violence in my life a lot of difficulty a lot of fear. And I realized that every morning I'd wake up and need to get out of the situation or need to change things. But I had to change things in a way that was actually beneficial to myself and not getting myself from the frying pan into the fire, going from one difficult thing to another. So what happens is if we're acting on aggression and fear, I knew that I would just go into another bad situation. What I did instead was try very hard to move my mind toward serenity, toward making decisions, living situation, working situation decisions based on a sense of openness and kindness to myself rather than fear and panic. Using the template of a, of a date, which I think is a great kind of template really, or a great, you know, sort of way to look at it. It is a little bit like jumping the gun and <laughs> showing that you're too nervous or too frightened or too acquisitional or I love you and it's the first day, it's like calm down, you know? It's like you don't have, to, it doesn't have to be dramatic. It doesn't have to be amazing. It just needs to start with the sense of feeling safe. Does that make sense? The sense of making another person feel safe. And when we're making big decisions for ourselves, it's like making ourselves feel safe. Or, or maybe better said, not that we're making ourselves feel safe, but we're allowing ourselves to find safety within ourselves. And when we find that, the other person will find that, and the world will also find that. I think that's the first stage of contact. It's like saying, 
everything settled down here, pacified. Another example that gets used sometimes is if you're dealing with somebody who's unruly and difficult, and rather than exacerbate the situation by getting in their face, you might pacify them and give them a chair and ask them to sit down, give them a situation whereby they might calm down so that the situation can reduce its urgency and actually have more of a sense of possible communication. So the first stage is that sense of connecting to yourself, accepting the moment, and just being present. The second stage then is when we are willing to reach out a little bit. If we're in a difficult situation with another person, we can attack them or we can make demands upon them or we could preemptively create aggression against them. And that will only prejudice the situation toward more antipathy. And even if we get our way by coercion, and aggression, it's short-lived. And there's always another shoe that's gonna drop from that. It never really works in the long run. It creates negative karma, so to speak, because it sets up a pattern in motion whereby somebody's upset and certainly will at some point retaliate. But if we could begin a negotiation by offering something to someone or making an offering to the space, and taking a few minutes to arrange the room in such a way that it looks nice, that it doesn't create a lot of confusion for people. Taking a minute to arrange ourselves in such a way that people find safe and connected, right? The next stage is to make them feel good. So if you're sitting there in the date wondering, what am I gonna say? What am I gonna say? Well. The first thing is don't say anything. Let the other person say, ask some questions, reach out and maybe offer a compliment, which is always a beautiful way to start anything. If I tell you, wow, thank you so much for meeting with me today. You look lovely, or this is really kind, or I've actually always admired your shares or whatever it is. You connect with somebody in a way that uplifts them, then you're really talking to the greater part of them. If you attack them, then you're only talking from their lowest point of view, right? If we actually start with some sense of they have to make us feel better, or I'm angry, or I'm going to play this game, or I'm going to manipulate that thing, then we're actually, you know, going off on the total wrong foot. The enlightened activity is to actually make an offering. And an offering has no giver, as it said, no gift, no receiver. It's just completely a sense of opening up and letting go. So the first offering that we give is to simply, um, is to simply allow the other person to find themselves in the best possible situation, because then we're dealing with the easiest possible situation, if that makes sense. They feel good about themselves. We've made them feel good about themselves. Now, if you are in a situation, which frequently happens, where you don't want to make someone feel good about themselves, the idea of that you're just being civil is still quite important. That, that maybe you could just be like, Offer them a seat, have a chair, do you want some water? Do the basic things to create a situation that's more human and less animal and contentious and violent. Even if it's somebody you don't like or if a situation that doesn't make you happy, you could begin with a sense of civility. So the first stage of just letting go of your own feelings and your own angst your own panic and coming back to some sense of pacifying the aggression and being in serenity. The second stage is about offering, making a gift to the other person, whether it's a spot of tea, offering them a light of their cigar, or whatever it is that makes you feel like you're letting something go in the favor of the situation. 
that then opens the door to the largest part of the three stages, which is magnetizing is traditionally the word, but the um, actual sense is one of real communication with the world and with the other person. And when I instruct this, sometimes I like to instruct this part as Tonglen practice. So the first part is basic shamatha meditation. That's the white. The second part, which I misspoke during the meditation is actually golden colored, which is the enriching, the giving, right? And um, when we actually do that, that's more like engaging our loving kindness practice or kind of opening up. And then this third stage, the magnetizing, which is a red colored, real compassion is about like Tonglen practice. It's about breathing out our loving kindness and breathing in the aggression and the pain and difficulty, and breathing out our loving kindness and breathing in the pain, aggression and difficulty. The reason for that is not to be further victimized by the situation, nor to be a turn the other cheeky kind of person in a kind of absurd, ridiculous finger in the throat kind of way, <laughs> you know, nauseating way of just giving away everything. That's not the point. It's actually quite a powerful position to accept the aggression and the difficulty and realize it can't hurt you and then to breathe out kindness and space, at least to yourself. And I'm a big believer in that. If you're doing Tang Len, it could be for another person, or it could just be to release the aggression in your own body. Sometimes when I'm on the phone with one of my relatives, actually any number of them, um, I get so irritated and upset when I notice my body is so tense. And I start doing this tongue Ren practice where I just breathe in and breathe out. And I start to relax. And it always seems like the other person is beginning to relax. It almost seems magical. I'm not a proponent of magical thinking. So I don't really think of it that way. But it does seem to happen when I relax. My world begins to relax. So actually beginning to be in a situation where I'm actually listening to another person. If you're in a date, this is the stage where you actually maybe reach across the table and grab their hand a little bit or just make some kind of physical contact where you actually make some eye contact now that they feel safe and that it's okay. It's not too aggressive. You're not scaring anybody, you know? And also, if this is a stage in a difficult situation, it's really where we're actually have to have the bravery to be willing to change and listen because maybe this other person has something we need to hear so whether it's a date which also could be true because frequently dates go people turn out to be completely different than you expect and rather than be upset about that maybe allowing ourselves to change and be touched by the circumstances is really good. The activity of a Buddha is that the Buddha never is trying to proclaim themselves. The Buddha is never trying to make it about their point of view. That's all very lower realm stuff. Maybe that's stuff we need to do sometimes, or that's the way politicians need to work, or that's the way some people need to be. But if we're really talking about enlightened activity, we're not talking about getting down there and street fighting. We're talking about having the largesse to really open our heart and listen to another person. The final stage is destroying. And sometimes that destroying is just ending the conversation in a good way, bowing out together, saying thank you on a date. Maybe it's like you begin with boundaries that that first date you're taking them home and you're going home and you're making it clear, but you're setting up a second date maybe, right? That that's all very clear so that nobody's not sitting there waiting going, why aren't they calling or what's happening? If it's in a situation of a contentious situation, actually being able to say, this is how I feel and then leave it there 
and having the strength, this is the hard part, to let the other person disagree or let the other person feel differently or let the other person clearly not want to see you again or whatever it is. The final stage is just letting go. You've opened your heart, you've settled your mind, you've encouraged their best potential, you've shared, and now it's time to go. And when it's time to go, it's time to go. Another application of these four stages, another way to explain how they might work, but also a very practical way is over time. So for instance, if you're having a difficult relationship with somebody, then the first stage might be pacifying where you're just trying not to make trouble. The second stage might be where you are actually trying to make them feel better about themselves and see if that doesn't change things. The third stage might be to really reach out and communicate and try to touch with their heart. But the fourth stage might be to have the bravery to just stop say it's over and it's not working and I'm sorry and thank you and just let it go right so that ending is as important certainly in Buddhist theory generally very much in the Zen tradition very much in the Buddhist the Tibetan Buddhist traditions this idea of just having a crisp clean ending to things and not letting things be all messy and unclear you know is also very important 